Good evening and welcome. I'm Dr. Laura Taylor, Associate Professor of Theology and the President of the Theta of Minnesota Chapter of Phi Beta Kappa here at the College of St. Benedict and St. John's University. I'm delighted to be here with you all today for our 2022 induction ceremony. Before we begin our ceremony, I want to acknowledge that the College of St. Benedict and St. John's University occupy the original homelands of the Dakota and Ashinaabe people. We honor, respect, and acknowledge the indigenous people forcibly removed from this territory whose connection remains today. St. Benedict's Monastery and St. John's Abbey previously operated boarding schools for native children. Now, students, faculty, and staff, many of whom are in the room, are working to repair relationships with our native nation neighbors. As the president of the Theta of Minnesota chapter of Phi Beta Kappa is a particular pleasure for me to greet and welcome as our guests, the family and friends of our newest members. Joining me in welcoming each of you today is our distinguished platform party, the transitional president of the College of St. Benedict, Lori Heyman, the transitional president of St. John's University, James Mullen, provost for the College of St. Benedict and St. John's University, Richard Ice, Dr. Sean Kohlberg, Associate Professor of Theology and our keynote speaker for the ceremony today, Dr. Ellie Perlman, Associate Professor of History and our chapter's Vice President, Sheila Hellerman, our chapter's historian, and Dr. Clark Cotton, Associate Professor of Biology and our chapter's Secretary and Treasurer. Phi Beta Kappa is rich in its history, traditions, and symbolism which you will learn throughout our ceremony today. And because this is an academic honor society, it is a tradition for faculty and staff to wear academic regalia at the ceremony, which explains our attire today. We wear these robes as a sign of recognition, achievement, and honor, but also as a sign of respect for our inductees and their accomplishments during their time at our universities. We will begin our ceremony with a welcome from the transitional president of the College of St. John's University, Dr. Jim Mullen. Thank you. Thank you and good evening, Phi Beta Kappa inductees, faculty members and families. Thank you all for joining us for this significant and most joyful occasion celebrating some of our most accomplished students and scholars. On behalf of St. John's University and the College of St. Benedict and Transitional President Lori Heyman, it is my honor to welcome each of you to our Phi Beta Kappa induction ceremony. Phi Beta Kappa is the nation's oldest academic honor society. There are only 290 chapters at colleges and universities throughout the United States and I am proud to say you are about to join the only Benedictine chapter among those institutions. Only the top 10% of liberal arts and science graduates are invited to join. As new members, you are in distinguished company. But the numbers surrounding Phi Beta Kappa are not nearly as important as the mission that is at its core. The initials Phi Beta Kappa represent the Greek translation of the society's motto. Wisdom, or love of knowledge, is the guide of life. In fact, the Phi Beta Kappa mission seeks not only to recognize academic excellence, which we are doing tonight, but also to champion the liberal arts and to foster freedom of thought. My deepest desire is that every student present tonight can reflect on how the College of St. Benedict and St. John's University have helped you to engage with both, and in doing so, enhance not only your mind, but your heart. A liberal arts education is focused on educating the whole person. 
It is centered on the belief that broad-based education is inherently valuable in preparing college graduates for a lifetime of engaged citizenship, professional success, courageous leadership, and commitment to the common good. Your induction tonight serves to highlight your readiness in each of these arenas. Tonight's induction also reflects your ability to think freely. While technology today allows us to gather huge amounts of information in ways that were once unimaginable, without the ability to question, to deconstruct and reconstruct that information, we are unable to benefit from it. Questioning is at the heart of free thinking and at the very center of a liberal arts education. Questioning is what separates information from knowledge and knowledge from wisdom. Tonight, we celebrate your ability to think critically, to pose challenging questions, and to investigate further. Through your liberal arts education, you've learned how to learn. So well done. We are very proud of you. You are remarkable young people with extraordinary intellectual gifts to offer your world. Do so with confidence, with conviction, with compassion, and courage. And before I close, I would like to recognize and express my gratitude for the work of the committee that selected the students for induction under the direction of Dr. Peter Oman. In addition to reviewing the transcripts of many outstanding candidates, they look not only for excellent grades, but a breadth of coursework in the liberal arts and sciences, an outstanding academic engagement that often does not show up on transcripts. Thank you also to the officers of the Theta Chapter of Minnesota, Dr. Taylor, Dr. Perlman, Dr. Cotton, and Sheila Hellerman for advancing scholarship in liberal arts and sciences at the College of St. Benedict and St. John's University, and for upholding a standard that makes us great. So my colleague students, you are poised to lead in your communities, in your future professional roles, in your families, and in our world. Embrace your promise and set it to its full measure in service to your world. Congratulations on this wonderful achievement. Thank you. Thank you, President Mullen. Honored guests, today we are welcoming 56 new student candidates for membership in course into our Phi Beta Kappa chapter. These student candidates have qualified for election and now wish to be admitted into our academic honor society. We shall welcome them into an association with all those who have been members of Phi Beta Kappa, past and present. While our uh, chapter was founded only 13 years ago, this is a ceremony that goes back nearly 250 years to the time of the founding of our nation. Our chapter historian, Sheila Hellerman, will now explain some of the history of the Phi Beta Kappa Society so that you can better understand the values and missions of the society today. On December 5th, 1776, a group of students at the then all-male Society of William and Mary in Williamsburg, Virginia, met to create a secret society, Phi Beta Kappa, that was both intellectual and social in purpose. The three original stated aims of the society were friendship, morality, and literature or scholarship. Their president's greeting to the new members in 1779 reads in part, here you are to indulge the matters of speculation, that freedom of inquiry that never dispels the clouds of falsehood by the radiant sunshine of truth. Other Phi Beta Kappa chapters were soon established at Yale and Harvard and the society continued to grow and improve. By 1875, for example, Phi Beta Kappa enlarged its membership to include women. By 1883, the society had more than 25 chapters, and the United Chapters of Phi Beta Kappa were founded to bring the scattered chapters into some uniformity. 
This organization has its headquarters in Washington, D.C., and there are now 286 chapters at leading colleges and universities throughout the United States. Phi Beta Kappa takes great pride in its origins, but we believe that the society is even more vital and relevant today than it was at our founding in 1776. You are now a part of our storied history, and you are the key to the society's future as we emphasize the ideals of freedom of expression and civil discourse and advocate now more than ever for the values of the liberal arts and sciences. These values were eloquently summarized in the following statement by one of the society's most eminent members, Charles Evans Hughes, the late Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. The particular interest of Phi Beta Kappa is in liberal education, intensive, critical study of educational aims and methods has found nothing to take its place. Phi Beta Kappa holds aloft the old banner of scholarship. And to the students who have turned aside from the easier paths and by their talent and fidelity have proved themselves to be worthy, it gives the fitting recognition of a special distinction. Thank you, Sheila. We'll now ask our initiates to first make a promise and then to be formally welcomed in as new members of the Theta of Minnesota chapter of Phi Beta Kappa. Will the student candidates for membership and course please rise? In accordance with the rules of this chapter and in consequence of our good opinion of your intellectual character, Supported by your record high achievement at these institutions, you have been selected as worthy of becoming members of the Phi Beta Kappa Academic Honor Society. Your names have been submitted to the scrutiny of the constitutional electors of this chapter and have been met with their approval. Your presence here today signifies your desire to become members of this honorable society. Therefore, I now inquire, do you solemnly promise that you will uphold the society's values of intellectual curiosity, critical thinking, and freedom of expression, and seek to reflect credit upon your affiliation with this venerable fellowship of learners. So you can say, wonderful, thank you. All right, you can sit down now. Oops. Okay. Each of you has pledged to uphold the values of Phi Beta Kappa and we will now welcome you into our ranks and register you as a member. Since Phi Beta Kappa was once a secret society, we also have a secret handshake. <laughs> this tradition goes back centuries. When two members of the society would pass each other on the street, they would take these two fingers and draw them across their mouths to say their lips were sealed. Now when two members meet, it's those same two fingers clasped, and that is the secret handshake. You extend your first two fingers of your right hand and keep the other two fingers slightly curled. So it's basically a handshake with two fingers. Um, or if you want to think about it as dividing your fingers into a V or the long live and prosper from Star Trek and then folding your fingers uh, around, you could do that too. Though the grip fell out of favor in the early 20th century, there has been a resurgence of interest in it recently, or so they tell me. Uh, you can try it out with me during this welcome into our chapter. Uh, but if you prefer, you can do the traditional handshake uh, on stage. All right, so with the first row of initiates rise to approach the stage, as our secretary, Clark Cotton, calls your name, please come forward to be greeted into the chapter and to sign the register. And I will come over here and you can practice. Braden Altina, Madeline Anderson, Elise Backer. Rachel Barda.
Maria Bedford. Jenna Benson. Carly Bory. Julia Buntrock. John Saratelli. Jack, uh, Jack Doyle. Catherine Fenske. Adeline Fisher. Matthew Gish. Abigail Goff, Jack Grabinski, Jillian Greenberg. Let's see, second row, you can go ahead and stand. Faith Granda. Cassandra Groning. Alexa Hennen, Grace Hillemeyer, Sarah Holmes, Stephanie Holmgren, Emily M. Abigail Jacobs. Abigail Kaluza. Sarah Kelly. Katherine Kistler. Noah Knapp. Connor Kochler. Maxwell Kraus, Julia Kristoviak, Isaac Kubalik, Gabriella Lott. Elena Lozano. Mary Ludwig. Margaret Mahata. Lisbeth Martinez Port. Catherine Mendel. Mai Wen. Clara Nowak. K. 
Kayla O'Leary. Kathleen Powell. Corey Pekarik. Teresa Rainier. Andrew Reinhout. Brennan Rosenthal. Catherine Schultz. Bridget Smith. Hannah Sobani. Madeline Stringer. Jadrian Thompson. Max Varela, Fabian Venegas Ramos, Sydney Walker, Claire Westby, Zhaohan Yen. By election of the chapter, by your assent to its pledge, and by the placing of your signature in our registration book, the society's requirements for initiation are fully satisfied. In the presence of these members of the society, as well as your friends, mentors, and family gathered here, it is now my pleasure to officially welcome you as the new members of Phi Beta Kappa. Congratulations. <laughs> Each year, our student members in course who were elected last year as juniors select the keynote speaker for our induction ceremony. Our chosen speaker this year is Associate Professor of Theology, Dr. Sean Kohlberg. I now invite Dr. Kohlberg to share his address titled Sapientia et Memoria, The Liberal Formation of Self for the World. Dear friends and colleagues, as students and esteemed members of Phi Beta Kappa, and I don't have it written here, but moms and dads and brothers and sisters, thank you for being here today. Thank you for sending your sons and daughters to St. Ben's and St. John's, and whatever has gone into the formula that has made them the amazing women and men that they've become. It's a pleasure to be with you this afternoon and to celebrate this intellectual and communal accomplishment of our newest members. Congratulations to you, new inductees on this achievement. 
You've used your gifts well during your time at the College of St. Benedict and St. John's University. You've made the most of opportunities for learning, community, and the sacred pursuit of wisdom during an especially difficult time marked by COVID and all kinds of social challenges. And yet, here you are, having sought to draw significant learning and growth from the opportunities and challenges set before you. Well done. I am sincerely humbled and edified to share company with you today. My sense is that students are also tired here at the end of an unusually demanding and uh, academic year. So in our time together, I will endeavor to share a few chestnuts of thought that hopefully do not demand terrific feats of deduction or analysis. There's no term paper or final exam that follows my words. Only punch and I hope some cake. Okay? I offer these reflections hoping that they might illumine and connect some of your experiences as Bennies and Johnnies over the past years. I'd like to begin with an ancient maxim shared by philosophers and early Christian thinkers. It's a simple statement. You cannot love what you do not know. You cannot love what you do not know. For many of us, the act of love, which is an act of freedom, and the act of knowing, which is an act of rationality, are deeply connected. It is the acquisition of experience or facts knowing a thing that creates desire to possess or commune with it. Love motivates and moves us into action, but love doesn't fall out of the sky. For example, it is only the knowledge of the gooey interior of the Cadbury cream egg that sends me to Walgreens the week after Easter with a sense of love to purchase the remaining eggs. It is knowing that I enjoy the smooth chocolate and not quite identifiable yellow center <laughs> that stirs up or enkindles a love inside of me for those foil-wrapped delights. Knowledge guides my desire, so much so that I cross lanes of traffic and risk to be late to a faculty meeting to find communion with those cream eggs. Examples like this prod us to see an intrinsic and causal connection between learning and the formation of our love. Knowing generates love, and love builds up a desire for knowledge. On my best days, I love my spouse because I know or have experienced marvelous things about her. And likewise, being in love, I find myself wanting to experience or know the mystery that is Dr. Kristen Kohlberg even more deeply. Here in St. Ben's and St. John's, we not only want you to be good knowers, we want you to be good lovers. Yes, I just said that. <laughs> huh? We want your knowing and loving to go hand in hand. In the best of worlds, CSB, CSBSJU should be a training ground for knowing and loving where you steadily synchronize these vital dimensions of your human life. But there's a challenge here. Knowledge doesn't automatically translate into good or well-ordered love. In fact, as we've learned, knowledge can be dangerous. The knowledge of certain chemical reactions, for example, can be quite destructive when attached to disordered love. The learned knowledge of speech, rhetoric, persuasive argument can be equally destructive when it is uninformed, when it shows itself as hate speech, unjust domination of the other, or unbalanced self-interest that puts others at significant risk or disadvantage. Raw knowledge, like raw power or raw resources, has the power for good or malicious use. So we at CSB SJU must be aiming for something other than raw knowledge. Diverse human cultures have sought to distinguish the difference between knowledge in the Latin scientia or notitia and wisdom in the Latin sapientia. This is particularly true in liberal arts settings where there is a sense that knowledge is good when it is well ordered when it fits individual data points into a system that promotes the highest good, common goods that edify and support all people, particularly those who are most in need or most vulnerable. The wise woman or man can see a range of goods made possible by knowing many things, and from those choose in love those goods which promote optimal outcomes. 
For that reason, St. Ben's and St. John's does not train people simply to know stuff. That's dangerous. That sounds like something that might happen at the University of St. Thomas. <laughs> Come to think of it, does St. Thomas even have a Phi Beta Kappa chapter? Okay. Well, in any case, here at St. Ben's and St. John's, Knowing fits into a larger movement we call the pursuit of wisdom, where knowledge is sought for the greater good and the community at large. So how does this happen? How do knowing and loving migrate into wisdom? Are you ready for this? One way of approaching this challenge is from the vantage point of memory. It is memory that can train our knowing and our loving in the way of wisdom. I suspect that sounds a little anticlimactic to you. Memory? You might ask, how can such a simple thing as memory transform our knowing and loving into wisdom? My first answer is, somewhat ironically, forget everything you knew about memory. Unremember your memory of memory. In our modern world, memory often has a static or inorganic quality or connotation to it. We think of memory as those essentially dead things that we have stored on our phone or our hard drive. We pull them up and we manipulate them and we use them for our own purposes. This, my friends, is not memory. This is stored data, stored knowledge. It's not terribly different from the content on a Wikipedia page. And just like those pages of in information, it can be dangerous if misused. Just ask anyone who's had their personal data hacked, right? Or misused to their, uh, to their own uh, harm. Memory, on the other hand, is organic. A living reality that can be held individually by a person and collectively by people. Memory is an active and summative recollection of abstract and embodied experiences that shape every active thought that the human mind conceives. Think about it for a moment. You cannot think apart from memory. The words you use, the concepts you draw from, the embodied experiences that shape you all contribute to the thought that's coming forth in your mind right now. Memory is the wellspring that shapes and inflects the ideas you conceive in your mind and ultimately directs your love that pours forth from your knowledge or ideas. A simple memory of a good or bad meal can shape the way you think about food or a restaurant, and it can shape your desire to return or flee from it. Here again, we have to resist the urge to see memory, memoria in the Latin, as a static set of knowledge points. It is decidedly not. Memory is malleable. That is, it can be shaped and formed for a variety of purposes, and it's fecund. That is, having a radical potential to create new things. The memories you have in your mind are forever evolving. The memories you might have of an early birthday, a moment of profound fear, a meaningful kiss or embrace, or even your first days here as Benny's and Johnny's have all evolved. They are not snapshots frozen in time. They are experiences you continue to add and shape meaning. Your first kiss might well evoke different emotions now than when it happened. That's because you're steadily, both consciously and unconsciously, refining that memory to serve your larger field of knowing and loving more effectively. If I kept my first kiss hermetically sealed in the range of emotions I felt at the time, well, I might never kiss again. Whew. That first kiss took a ton of effort and risk and joy, while also lacking any real skill or expertise. As I recall it now, I don't live those same emotions as I did in the original moment. Now that kiss might give me openness, or caution, or trust, or something. Things I didn't experience at the time. The past memory is shaping my knowledge and my love in an ever ancient and ever new way. PBK members, you stand at the precipice of a being dangerous or wise. You can take what you've learned and experienced here in this liberal arts setting that has exposed you to wide fields of human knowledge and use it abusively and solely for personal gain. 
Or you can find deeper, more profound happiness as wise Bennies and Johnnies in the world. Wisdom requires the cultivation of your memory. Like a beautiful garden, your memory is filled with plants needing water, pruning, fertilization, and as Frog reminded Toad, beautiful singing to inspire their growth. Let me pull this talk toward its end by outlining three ways to attune and, and cultivate your memory. First and foremost, cultivate what is good and life-giving. What have you learned as Bennies and Johnnies that promotes your best self, your best flourishing? The liberal arts identify nuggets of human wisdom across varieties of fields of experience, all of which can help us grow. What did you learn in your biology, your political science, or your communications class that revealed to you some truth about the dignity of humankind, including your own dignity, or creation in general? Search for those nuggets, like pearls of great price, and name them in your memory. Each time you name and come back to them, adding meaning and stressing their value, they become more and more fruitful for the way you live your life. As plants, they vine out and open and fill the spaces of your mind if you but water and cultivate them. So come back again and again to those seminal moments of learning you encountered as CSB, SJU students. Let your education here continue to feed you as lifelong learners. Second, learning is not merely an individual, I'm sorry, yeah, learning is not merely an individual exercise. If we as Benedictine places have conveyed anything to you, it should be that learning is fundamentally communal. It is the discipline of community, of being accountable to one another, that drives out pure self-interest and helps us to discover the larger range of choices and goods that are available to us. Liberation theologians over the last half century have reminded us that communal memory has to involve dangerous or subversive memories. We have to ask ourselves sometimes why we choose to remember things in a particular way and to ask ourselves whether the absence of certain figures or truths from our memory is an effort to erase inconvenient realities. Racism, sexism, the domination of cult one culture over another. Sometimes in a garden one plant can dominate and thrive so much that it threatens to choke off the others. When we attend to our communal memory, asking those dangerous questions about what and how we remember, we prune our recollection and cultivate space for diverse memories that produce a knowledge and a love that is flexible, adaptable, and able to identify the beautiful and the good in a variety of modalities. Our Benedictine friends remind us that doing so makes our memory stable, one of the vows that Benedictines take, stability. That is, we become more resilient and able to grapple with challenge and change because we are rooted in the sure-footedness of communal experience and wisdom. Finally, do not let set limits on the power of your memory. We must regularly ask ourselves with deep humility, what does our memory have to teach us in this moment? How can it shape what we know and what we love right now? How can it recreate and imagine anew the question before us? Sometimes we seal off our memory from a present scenario because of what might come from remembering, assuring ourselves that the past and present have little in common. That again is dangerous. It leaves us with knowledge but no wisdom. In the Christian tradition, memory is the source of all understanding, and understanding gives way to love. Together they are one creative force, causing all things to be and moving them toward their best outcomes. In fact, this in the ancient language of the Trinity, I'm sorry, this is the ancient language of the Trinity, that the first person of the Trinity remembers and causes, and from it springs forth a second person who is wisdom or logos, and from the first and second persons proceeds a third who is love and gift. And together in this trifold movement, this action of persons creates, shapes, and loves all things into being. St. Augustine in the De Trinitate writes, Now this trinity of the mind is God's image. 
The mind remembers and understands and loves itself. And it also has the power to remember, understand, and love its maker. And in doing so, ready for this? It attains wisdom. So here we are. Many of you are graduating. You've looked at your degree works page and seen all the check marks. Now, even when they changed the degree works page this year, right? We still look and can, yeah, I know, see those check marks, right? And you've finished your majors and minors and capstone projects. You've deposited untold amounts of data into your memory. Now the next stage of wisdom, the next stage of a liberal arts education, and the real meaning of Phi Beta Kappa begin. You're called to cultivate memory, your personal memory and those shared in community. Search for those things which are truly life-giving, and while attending to those dangerous memories lying there too. Use this memory to become co-creators in our world. People who cultivate and pursue wisdom are people who reshape and recreate our world. To Augustine's thinking, they share the mind of God. Bennies and Don Johnnies are not dangerous knowers or dangerous lovers. We leave that to Tommy's. We pursue a wisdom that moves us a little all into deeper communion of love, one that resembles the communion of the persons in the Trinity and creates space for universal flourishing. Johnny and Benny PBK members can do this, and I'm confident you will. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kohlberg. To our newest chapter members, you now belong to the nation's oldest academic honor society, whose past members have included 17 US presidents, 42 Supreme Court justices, and over 150 Nobel laureates. Your membership in Phi Beta Kappa will open a door to a network of successful individuals in nearly every career field, and this accomplishment will set you apart to future graduate school programs and employers. Support the society's endeavors and goals and be a dedicated advocate for the liberal arts in our society. Once you're settled after graduation, check to see if there's a Phi Beta Community Alumni Association nearby. We here at St. Ben's and St. John's and the Theta Minnesota chapter hope you stay connected with us as well. Let us know about your adventures, challenges, and successes as you move out into the wider world. Before we conclude our ceremony, I have just a few announcements. First, there's a reception following the ceremony in the Great Hall, uh, which is the building just past the big Abbey Church, the next large building over, and we hope you all will attend to celebrate with us. Second, after we process out, We'd like to take a group photo of our new inductees, um, but since it's questionable weather outside, we'll have you all come back in here and we'll take a quick photo, and then we'll reconvene in the Great Hall so you can join your friends and family uh, for our reception. And now, I would like to invite the newest members of the Phi Beta Kappa to please rise. On behalf of the entire Theta chapter of Minnesota, I would like to extend a heartfelt congratulations to each of you. It has been our joy as professors, administrators, and staff to accompany you in your learning. We know that you will continue to be the strength of a new generation. Please leave here with our best wishes for your future and with our belief in you as champions of an education in the liberal arts. Let your love of learning be your guide. We at Theta Minnesota are so proud of you. We wish you all the best, and we await with great eagerness to see and hear about everything that you will accomplish. So before we process out, I would like to invite our musician here to come up and start the music. Uh, but before we process out, please let's have one last round of applause for the newest members of Phi Beta Kappa. And 
I will lead the procession, the platform party will come off the stage, and then the faculty will follow, and then the students, and then the students will come circle back around for a photo. Um, all right. Thank you all for coming and for joining us. We're glad to be here. Or someone might have to sing. I'm not sure. You ready? <laughs> Thank you.